Good to celebrate the love of our God this morning. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. I'll uh, be continuing where we left off last week. If you're visiting with us this morning, we've been working our way through uh, John's letter, the first uh, letter of John to the church. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, there should be one right in front of you there in the pew. I'd encourage you to grab it and follow along. We want to dig into the Word of God. Uh, it doesn't really matter so much what I say this morning. What really matters is what the Word of God has to say to us. So let me encourage you to follow along in His Word. Uh, let's, uh, let's do this. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll just ask the Lord's blessing on our time in his word this morning. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, as we come this morning, we come with thankful hearts, thankful for the love that you, you showed us, Lord, most clearly on the cross. As we sang just a moment ago, those, those words, how deep the Father's love, we, we cannot begin to fathom the cost of our sin, of, of our life in Christ that you would give your own son to come and to die on the cross. Why should I gain? Oh Lord, I do not have an answer. We marvel this morning at your love for us. We acknowledge as we come before you into your presence that we are a sinful people and we do not deserve your love or your grace, but you have shown it to us. And Lord, we are so thankful this morning for the life that we have in Christ. We have gathered here this morning as your people, called by your name to hear your word, to worship and sing your praises. Lord, our heart's desire is that you would be glorified in this place, that all who come would know that they have entered into the presence of the living God. And Lord, even as we gather here this morning, we pause and we remember those who are unable to gather, those who are in shelters this morning, those who are outside of their homes. Lord, some who are sitting on rooftops this morning, uh, Lord, as a result of the hurricane and the flooding. And Father, we ask that you would just be with them in a special way. Watch over, uh, care for them. Be with those who have lost loved ones, who have lost life. Lord, we pray for first responders who are heading uh, full force into harm's way on this day, and we ask your watch over them. Lord, we come to you with all of our cares uh, because we know that you care for us. And so we pray that you would uh, do a work in your church as we see needs abound around us, particularly in the face of disaster. I pray that your church would be noted for its response. May we be seen for our love as we seek to meet the, ne the needs of those who have experienced loss and hurt. Lord, may your church always be characterized by love. A love for you, a love for one another. Your word has told us that the world will know us by our love for one another. Lord, we, we don't do that well. We're a selfish people, a sinful people. I'm so thankful this morning for your grace. I pray that you would work through your word this morning to accomplish your purpose. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we look at 1 John chapter 3, I couldn't help but think of uh, that little, uh, maybe you've seen it, uh, if you, some of you are going to think I'm crazy, there's little stick man memes, right? Be like Bill or don't be like Bill. Right? Some of you are nodding along, some of you go, what's a meme? I don't even know what that is, right? So I, I had them to pull it up there. They're going to just a picture. It's silly. It's not a big deal, all right? I have to turn around because I can't see that back there, so just bear with me, all right? This is Bill. Bill buys his girlfriend flowers occasionally. Bill knows women must be loved and treated with respect. Bill is smart. Be like Bill, all right? So that's, I had to look hard to find one that was okay and suitable to share in here this morning. Right? A lot of times it says, don't be like Bill. I, you know, uh, you know, this is Bill. Bill likes to drive in the passing lane under the speed limit. Bill's a jerk, right? Don't be like Bill, right? So that's personal, okay? Just, uh, we, we could, you could take that down, right? You get the idea, right? So, the only reason I show that is simply this. I think the Apostle John would have resonated with this, this idea. Because right? this morning, as we look at 1 John 3, what he's going to do is he's going to say, don't be like this, be like this. Right? And, and he gives us very clear examples. Right? So the title of our message this morning is, don't be like Cain, be like Jesus. Right? So that, that hopefully will stick with you. Uh, as we look at this together, 1 John chapter 3, I want to go back to look at verse 10 where we finished up last week because it really sets the stage for our time together this morning. 1 John 3.10, by this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love 
his brother. It is evident whose are the children of God. So John, once again, is just separating people into two categories, right? You either belong to the children of God or you belong to the children of Satan and there is no middle ground. We spent a lot of time talking about that, so I'm not going to elaborate a whole lot on that this morning. But understand, as you have gathered here this morning, that there's no room to play around in the middle. Right? There's no sense in which you're saying, well, I haven't, I haven't decided for Jesus yet. I haven't made up my mind. You, know, you either are in one of these two categories. You either belong to the children of God or you belong to the children of Satan. And that's it. All mankind fall into these categories. And so John is just driving this truth home for us. Last Sunday he said the children of God are characterized by their right living. Right? That they live a righteous, holy life. This is the way of life. Now, we don't do it perfectly, but this is our pursuit. Our aim is to live in a way that pleases our Heavenly Father, that seeks to obey His Word. Right? So this is characteristic of the children of God. And so we talked a lot about sin. Right? We talked a lot about disobedience and rebellion. That's important that we understand the nature of that because if we live our lives in sin and disobedience and rebellion, John says there's no sense in which we can call ourselves a Christian. You can say it, but just because you say it doesn't mean it's so. There has to be evidence in your life that this is true. So now he follows that up this morning, right? So we talked about right living. Now we're going to talk about right loving, right? So you saw it there at the end of verse 10. The one who does not love his brother is what? Is clearly, evidently not a child of God. So we're going to talk about love this morning. Love is a popular message. Last week was an unpopular message to talk about sin, to talk about disobedience, to talk about rebellion. People don't like to think about sin, but they like love. They love love, right? I mean, all we need is love, says the Beatles. Right? And, and, and the world resonates with that message. No one's going to argue with that message, right? If I say we should love one another, everybody's going to go, amen. Absolutely, right? The world outside would say, that's a great message. Everyone just needs to love one another. Here's the thing, though. Their definition of love is very different from a biblical definition of love. And so when we start to look at what the Bible says about love, then everybody's not so happy about what it says. So we want to we look carefully this morning at what the Word of God has to say about this area. So let's look at it. Verse 11, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. So again, John starts off with this familiar phrase at this point. This is the message you've heard from the beginning. Right? This is nothing new. It's the same message that you heard from the time that we came, from the time you heard about Jesus, from the time that you heard about life in Christ, this is the exact same message we have always shared. I'm not sharing with you something new. That was what those false teachers were doing, right? They, those who had been part of the fellowship, who had left, they said they once were part of us, now they're not part of us. They said, we have a new message. We have something superior. We have something better. And John says, you don't need anything. I gave you at the beginning this message and nothing has changed. That's important for us to grab a hold of. And in fact, the way in which John teaches here is important for us. If, you're, if you've been with us through this, you're going to say, Pastor, we already talked about loving one another. Right? We, John already dealt with that issue. You're right. He did back in chapter 2. He talked a great deal about how we should love one another. <laughs> how we should walk in the light. And that reflection of walking in the light is the way that we love each other. And you say, why are we talking about it again? Because that's what John does. He repeats that message back to his ears. Why? Because it's so important. It's so important that we grab a hold of it. And so sometimes repetition is not bad. Repetition can be a really good thing because we're not really good at it. We, we hear the message, we know the message, we applaud the message. We say, yes, love one another, but practically, day in and day out, we're not very good at carrying out this love. So, John says, listen, let me tell you again, this is the same message. The same message that Jesus shared with me, 
and the message that I want you to hear. Remember in the upper room, Jesus with his disciples, right? He knelt down and washed the feet. He washed their feet and then he gave them this message. John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. A new commandment. What is the newness of this commandment? It's, it's not, you know, love is as old as, as the world we live in, right? But to love as Jesus loved brings a newness to this command. I want you to love the way that I loved you, right? Be like Jesus. And this is a it's a present tense, active verb. It means this is the way, that this is to be the continual way of our life. As followers of Jesus, as children of God and his family, we are to be like this. It should be characteristic of us. We should be known for our love. So John just starts off with this clear command, this message that you've heard from the beginning, love one another. I know everybody's on board with that. But notice the contrast right off the bat. <clears throat> what John's going to do for us this morning is going to give he's going to give us a negative example and then he's going to give us a positive example, which really sets the stage for our outline, right? Don't be like Cain, be like Jesus. So in verse 12, he says, "We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother." And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers righteous. Now, this is the only time in, in John's letters that he makes reference to the Old Testament. Right? First, second, third John, all of his epistles. But here, he goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 4, and he pulls out Cain as an example of what not to be like. Now, for, for our sake, I think it'd be good for us to go back. I know most of you are really familiar with, this, with the account of Cain and Abel. Some of you, maybe not. So let's go back to Genesis 4. And let's look at it quickly together here. Genesis chapter 4. I'm going to start in verse 1, just so you can get the picture. Now Adam knew his wife, knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain, a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. All right, so we see, right? This is the first man born under sin. First man after the fall. And, and they both bring, I, I want you to understand this is important. Cain is not some angry atheist, right? This is, a, this is a man who's a religious man, a man who says he loves God, a man who wants to worship God, right? He's bringing an offering before the Lord, but it is not what God asked for. So he comes, but he comes in disobedience. He does not come in faith. We know this by Hebrews chapter 11, and God does not accept his offering, but he accepts the offering of his brother Abel. And God notices Cain's anger. And he says what? Sin is crouching at the door. Right? Satan, Satan desires, right? He's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He wants to crush. He wants to attack. And here he has one who is vulnerable. Right? Crouching at the door. Waiting to pounce. What happens? Verse 8. Cain spoke to, to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. His offering is rejected. His anger is aroused. 
and he takes it out on his own brother. Can you imagine? Right? His, and John tells us here, back, let's go back to 1 John chapter 3. He tells us why this all came about. How did it happen? Right? Don't be like Cain. Why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers righteous. Why did this happen? Because Cain was jealous of his brother. He was angry and he was evil. Right? Now I want you to understand, right? the picture of Cain here is a reflection of what? Of an evil, self-centered, fallen human heart. This is the first man born under sin, and it's a reflection of all men apart from Christ in their fallen nature. So the, the selfishness, the jealousy, the hatred, and the murder that we see flowing out of Cain is in each and every one of us apart from Christ. Now, the external murderous act very rarely do we get to that end. But all of that is there. All of that is in. We, we are all capable of what Cain did. I hope you understand that. Apart from Christ, in our fallen condition, this is who we are. The root of sin is there. So we see Cain, his murderous act there in Genesis chapter 4, and and. John says, don't be like that, right? We should not be like Cain. And some of you are going, no problem, right? Okay, I'm not, I'm not going down that road, right? We're not going to murder anyone. We're not going to kill anyone. I'm not taking anyone's life. But did you notice the progression there? Did you, did you see how it unfolded? See, Cain, Cain's murder is characterized by hate. It, was, it began in, in anger, and so we see, look down at verse 15. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. Now, John's just reflecting what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount, right? Matthew 5, verse 21, you've heard it was said, to those of old you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the cancel. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. See, Jesus goes right to the very heart of the issue. See, a murderous heart is revealed first in the heart. Right? It's revealed first in, the, in an attitude towards someone else. There's an anger there. There's a hatred there. There's a jealousy there. Have you ever said... I hate you. I hate you. Maybe to your brother or your sister. Maybe to your parents. Maybe to someone you work with or, or a neighbor. You just, you just, and maybe you wouldn't say it, right? But you feel it. In your heart, you, you feel like, what, what are you saying when you say, I hate you? You're saying, my life would be better without you. I don't want you here. I don't want you around. I wish you were gone. That's what you're saying, right? I hate you. This is at the heart of, this is exactly where Cain was at, right? And it led to murder itself. Some of you, maybe you, you would never dream of carrying out that act, but in your heart, that malicious intent is there. And that is characteristic of, what, of, a, of a child of Satan, the evil one, right? We see the evil one is characterized by Cain here. He was influenced by these satanic forces. In fact, I would say this. We, we see here the very root sin at the heart of murder, at the heart of anger, at the heart of hatred. You know, when we, come to, when we think about the evil one referred to there, we probably immediately think of John 8, 44, right? You are of your father, the devil, right? Your will is to do your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, right? Satan, right? He's characterized by murder, by killing, right? He's, he, he seeks to kill and destroy. But we have to go back even farther to really get to the heart of this. 
Uh, Isaiah helps us to unfold this. And this is where we really begin to see the root cause of murder and hate and anger and jealousy. Isaiah 14, 13. This is talking about the angel, right? The angel of light. This is talking about Lucifer. <laughs> you said in your heart... I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Right. What do we see here in the heart of Satan? We see what? A selfish desire. Right. We'll see shortly, right? The the characteristic of a child of God is, thy will be done. But the characteristic of a child of Satan is always, my will be done. Satan again and again says, I will, I will. And in his heart he's saying, God, I hate you. I wish you were gone. I don't want you here. I want your place. I want your position. We see jealousy. We see hatred. We see anger. But at the heart and the center of it all is a self-centered attitude. I don't know about you, but that puts all of us in danger, doesn't it? We are a selfish people. Self-centeredness, I, I believe this, is the characteristic of our day. We worship self. The God of me is, is what, what it's all about. And that is at the very heart of what we're looking at this morning. When he says, don't be like Cain, he's saying what? <laughs> don't be selfish, self-centered. Don't be jealous. Don't be hateful. Don't be murderous. Those are characteristics of the children of Satan. Now, he unfolds that, and then in verse 13, he says, Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. Now, he's still recalling that upper room discourse. He's still pulling out the words of Christ. Jesus said, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Don't be surprised when you're persecuted for my name's sake. And John's saying what? Don't be surprised that the world hates you. If you're a child of God, expect it. In fact, I would say this. You should be surprised if they don't. If, if you can get along just fine in the world and the world gets along fine with you and there's no clash and there's no dissonance, then something is off. Something's off. Everything that's unfolding with our city council right now is evidence of this truth, right? They hate Jesus and they hate Jesus' people. And if we just can flow along with the world and... and and everything's okay, there's a possibility that you're not really a child of God. See, John's saying, don't be surprised, brothers. We're seeing this come to a head more than any other point in our nation's history, right? We have been known as a Christian nation for a long time, but no longer. We live in, make no, we live in a secular culture that has no love for God. It has no love for God's people, and we should not be surprised that they hate us. Now, I know that strikes at some of our sensitivities, because right? we care a whole lot about what people think. And so you're like, I don't, I don't really want to be hated. I want to be liked. I want to be loved. Well, if you want to follow Jesus, you're going to be at odds with the world we live in at every turn. It doesn't, it doesn't work. They're not congruent. And so John's pulling that out for us this morning. And in verse 14, he says, We know, we know that we passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. <laughs> this is how we know. Right? This is why John's writing. Why is John writing? So that we may know that we have eternal life. How do I know that I passed from death to life? By my love. By my love for the brothers. Listen, we saw last week, living a holy life is evidence of saving faith. In the very same way, loving your brothers and sisters in Christ is a mark of the child of God. Don't you love the language here? Passing from death to life. 
We could do a whole message just on that. I won't. <laughs> right, so you're like fearful, right? But listen, we were dead in trespasses and sin. And Christ came and he gave his life. And in giving his life, he made it possible for us to have life. So when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you, are, you pass from death. You move from one position to another. That's all it is. It's moving from one place to another. You move from the place of death to the place of life, eternal life. So this transaction takes place in Christ. Praise God. My chains are gone. I have been set free. No condemnation now I dread. This is the this is the truth of what it means to be in Christ. Dear friends, brothers and sisters, we have passed from death to life. Now, if you're here this morning and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, there's never been a time where you recognize your sinfulness and you've never called on Jesus to save you, then the word of God is very clear. You still abide in death. You still abide in death. That is, that is where you reside. Death, you say, everybody dies. You're going to die, preacher. You're right. But I'm not going to die twice. <laughs> right? Everybody dies, but there is a physical death, and then there's a spiritual death, and ultimately there's an eternal death, and this is what we're talking about. What happens to you after you die? Where do you go when you stand before the God who made you? See, John says in verse 14, whoever does not love abides in death. It's evident, right? We know. We can be assured that we've been born again by our love for the people of God, but those who do not love God's people have, have not passed from death to life. If you have no love for God and you have no love for his people, then you can be sure that you are not truly born again. So sure, in verse 15, he says, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. He just equates this so clearly, right? If you have hate in your heart towards someone, it's, it's equivalent to a murderous act. And no murderer has eternal life. You say, preacher, you don't understand. You don't know what they've done to me. You don't know how they've hurt me. You don't understand what I deal with. You don't understand what I put up with. If you had to put up with that, if you had to put up with him, if you had to put up with her, you would hate them too. Listen to your heart. Listen to your heart, dear friend. John's, don't, don't think about what I'm saying here. Think about what the word of God is saying. If you have hate in your heart, it doesn't, it doesn't it's not congruent with being a child of God. So you can make all the excuses you want. But those who have come to Christ, they have a new capacity to love that those who are not in Christ do not. They have a new capacity to love, a new capacity to forgive that those who are not in Christ cannot. If you have hate in your heart, you better search carefully to see if you are truly in the faith. John says there's, no been, there's been no change in position. There's been no change in destination. Revelation 20, 14 says, Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. You abide in death if you have hate in your heart. And death and hell are cast in the lake of fire for all eternity. This is the end for those who are characterized by their hate. And you say, well, I don't hate, I don't hate everyone, right? I, I love, I, I do good things. But that hatred in your heart is the mark of a child of God. And you got to deal with it. You can't sweep it under the rug. You can't just hide it forever. And some of you are really good at hiding it, right? <laughs> you put on a good show and every, but you know your heart. And listen to this, dear friend, God knows your heart. He sees what I don't see. He sees what the people around you don't see. He knows what's going on with you. So you might as well just get real with him, right? Be honest. Come before him. Confess your sin. Now listen, right? We looked at the negative example, and, and I know it's not fun to think about the, the fallen and the darkness of our heart, but at the same time, in Christ, we have passed from death to life. And so now he moves from the negative to the positive in verse 16. 
If Cain is characteristic of a child of Satan, then Jesus is the prototype child of God. So he says, don't be like Cain, be like Jesus, verse 16, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. We don't have to look outside of Jesus, right? We don't have to look anywhere else. The kind of love that God desires for us as his people is seen in Christ. He laid down his life for us. You should marvel at that. God came to earth as a man for you. He died for you. He loved you. Have you ever heard that message with with ears to hear? God loves you. Jesus died for you. See, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you, right? If you don't understand your condition apart from Christ. (laughs) If you're sitting along the ocean and you're you're kind of sitting on the dock and these waves are just pounding against the dock and you're just sitting there watching it and somebody jumps in the water and they they go, I love you, I'm going to save you. And you're just sitting there going, I don't need saving. But if you're out in those waves and you are, you are... (laughs) flailing around and you're needing help and you're needing saving and somebody jumps in and says, I love you and I'm going to save you, then you what? You recognize. Many people feel like they're safe sitting on the dock and they're not out in the waves. But apart from Christ, you are dead, drowning, dying on your way to hell. And Jesus came to save you. He said, I love you. And he jumps into harm's way for you goes to the cross, takes the death that you should, feels the wrath of God that should be yours. It's this kind of love. Selfless, sacrificial love that God says he wants for his people. That is meant to be, right? So it's not all we need is love. Let's all just get along. Let's all, you know, it's not, no, this is, this is a different kind of love. It's a love says, I want the best for you, even if it hurts me. You see, Cain murdered, but Jesus sacrificed himself. Cain hated, but Jesus loved. Cain was jealous, but Jesus humbled himself. Cain was self-centered, and Jesus was selfless. You see the distinction? It is selfless, sacrificial love that is on display on the cross. Philippians chapter 2 says, Have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death on the cross. He, He did not, he was equal with God, but he did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. Jesus, by every right, should have came and just wiped us all out. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is holy in all of his ways. But he humbled himself and came as a man and died a a, a terrible death on the cross for you. And that selfless, sacrificial love is the very kind of love that he calls us to as his people. He says, we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. (laughs) Man, that... That ups the ante, doesn't it? He's not just saying, let's just all get along. Let's just all be happy, right? He's saying, I want you to love each other like Jesus loved you. If you're really a child of God, then act like it. Be like Jesus. So if you're part of the family of God, family loves each other, right? Family looks out for each other. Family sacrifices for each other. This is what Jesus is calling us to. A higher love than what we think. A love that we're willing to lay down our lives for the brothers. Are you willing to give of yourself for the people sitting around you? 
for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Yes, here and all around the world. That's, that's the call. That's the command. It's really hard for us to think in categories like that, isn't it? This is the, it's, it's almost as if looking at Cain, we're going, I would never kill anyone, right? That's the, that's the highest, worst outward act of a hatred's murderous heart. So now it comes and he looks at Jesus and he puts the, the highest, right, this selfless, sacrificial, there's no love like this love. And he says, I want you to live like that. And we go, well, I can't do that. I can't live like that. I can't love like that. And so we settle for lesser things. But Jesus has called us to love like he loves, to lay down our lives. And it may not come to that, right? He's not the likelihood that you're going to have to give your life for one of your brothers and sisters in Christ is, it's not likely, right? People kind of fall into two categories. Some of you are sitting here going, well, it's impossible to love like that. And others of you, maybe you're sitting here and you go, yeah, I'd do it. I, I, I'd, die for, I'd die for them. I'd die for my, I'd give, I'd, I'd, I'd do it. I'd give myself for my brothers and sisters in Christ. And yet, there's very people who say, yeah, I, I'd give myself. They're not willing to give their time. They're not willing to give their finances. They're not willing to give their talents in service to the Lord. You see, what, what John does here is he, he breaks this down into categories in which we can easily grab a hold of it. Right? So he's going to take this high and lofty idea of laying down our lives, and he's going to say, let me show you what it looks like. Look at verse 17. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? You see, laying down your life has to do with meeting the needs of your brothers and sisters in Christ. That's the equation here. <laughs> so, he says, you see a brother or sister in need, and you don't move to meet that need. You close up your heart. You got the ability to meet it, but you say, no. You close your heart to the need that's in front of you, and, and John says what? You're fooling yourself. You're fooling yourself. You're all talk. You're all talk. How does God's love abide in you? If you see your brother or sister in need and you do nothing when you could do something. Don't miss it. The, those words are striking. We were talking about this yesterday in our elder meeting. If anyone has the world's goods, I want you to, I want you to know, if you are within the sound of my voice this morning, that is you. You have this world's goods. There's never been a people on the planet with more goods and resources than we have here in the United States. Never. When he says, if you have this world's good, he's talking to you. He's talking to me. You realize that over 70% of the world population lives on less than $10 a day? 70%. We blow $10 at the drive through It's like nothing. Oh, brothers and sisters, we have a means to meet the needs of our brothers and sisters around the world in a way that no people ever has. Now, as I say that, I do want to take the opportunity to commend you as a church family. Because this is one of the things that I'm so thankful to be a part of when it comes to Grace Gospel Church. Because Grace Gospel has always had their eyes set outwardly on the mission field and on our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. And you give generously, you give sacrificially to needs time and time again. And so I want to I say to you, that's exactly what Jesus is talking about. We see a need, and we move to meet that need because we have this world's goods, and we have the ability to help, and we have the ability to come alongside, and we do something about it. Praise God. That's what should be characteristic of the church. And in that way, 
right? When we start looking globally, grace gospel, you shine. Right? You want to see the gospel advance. And you see your brothers and sisters in areas of need and poverty and hurt, and you say, let's help. But I don't think we do so good when it comes to locally. We see people in need all around us, and we shut up our heart. We have the ability, we have the means. I think we need to think through this practically this morning. That's what John wants, right? Personally, practically, how do I live this out? How do I lay down my life? See, laying down our lives can be done in countless ways, big and small, right? <laughs> loving like Jesus means loving selflessly, sacrificially, humbly, and that plays out in a, in a, a myriad of ways in our lives. It can mean sacrificing financially and materially. You see a brother or sister in Christ who, who has a need, Right? And you say, I'm going to give to help them. Right? Cars broke down, need groceries, right? I mean, we, right now we're in a situation where there are who knows how many people at this point who are going to end up out of their homes. They're going to need food. They're, not, they're going to need shelter. They're going to need, there's going to be a cleanup to follow. And you know who's going to respond? The church is going to respond. Because that's what, that's what God's people do. They see a need and they move to meet the need. That should be true of us personally, individually, right? Again, you guys are pretty good at this. You see your brothers and sisters in Christ. I have the, a real privilege as your pastor to see this play out. When, when you have a brother or sister in need. Oh my goodness. I know I've shared this before, but I like to brag on you a little bit. It's one of the joys of being part of, of a church family. I've seen people buy cars for others. Just give them a car when they need it. Buy food. I, I, I've seen people give things of great value in times of need. I've seen people give people a, a second, a third chance when nobody would even think about giving them another chance. That's love, where you're willing to sacrifice your goods for the good of someone else. And, and I know we start talking about, you say, well, I don't have a lot to give, but this goes beyond finances, dear friend. Right? This, goes to, this goes to time, which is probably the most precious commodity we have in our culture, is it not? As a people, we have... We have made ourselves so busy that we have no time for anyone else. Schedules are full. They're packed, right? So if you're going to lay down your life, it may be that you have to say, you know what? I've got this going on, but I'm going to put that aside to help my brother or sister in need. Now, I know I start messing with your calendar and your schedule, and you go, you've crossed the line, Pastor. Listen. That's what it means to sacrifice, right? That's what it means to be selfless. We say, I'm laying down my life for the good of someone else, for their needs. Maybe, maybe you, you give up one of your evenings to, to take, you, you see a young couple in our church who's got a, got a young baby. You say, you know what? They could probably use a night off. Why don't, why don't, you, bring, why don't you bring them over here? I'll watch them for the night. Oh, that time's precious, isn't it? But you could give your time to love your brother or sister in Christ. They need that. Right? I mean, we could, we could think of countless examples of how we could use our time. And what about our abilities and talents that God has gifted us with? How many times do we see a need and we shut up our hearts and we say, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. But you see the void. You see the need within the church. You see it among your people, and you say, I could do that. I don't want to do that. Or, I'm too busy to do that. But the kind of love that we see on display here is what? It's a sacrificial love. 
It's a selfless love that says, you know what? I'm going to love my brothers and sisters in Christ above myself. I'm going to put their needs first. That's the picture that we see here. Someone needs help. You have the means to help. And so you help. You move to meet the needs. Verse 18, John says, Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Talk is cheap. I love the church. I love God's people. I love God. But you never serve them. You never give to help them. It's good if you show up every once in a while. John says that kind of talk is cheap. It's cheap, right? He says, true love, genuine love that's characterized as someone who has been born again loves in deed and in truth. This is what James said, what? Be doers of the word and not hearers only. He went on to say in James 2, 17, So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. This kind of love is an action. It's not an attitude. It's not a feeling. It moves. It works. Do not love merely in talk, but in deed. Do something. Dear friend, we've seen a clear contrast in the word this morning. Children of Satan are characterized by the heart of Cain, a murderous, hateful, jealous, selfish heart. Children of God are characterized by what? A sacrificial, loving, humble, selfless. To which family do you belong? John says it's evident. It's evident by your love. And if you're here this morning and, and you have recognized the Spirit of God has opened your eyes to see that you are, you are not truly born again and you are not a child of God and that your end is death and hell, then dear friend, today, today you can call on him to save you. Jesus laid down his life for you. He died the death you deserve. He paid the penalty that should have been yours. And if you would call on him in faith and ask him to save you, then he'll forgive you and he'll give you this new heart and a new capacity to love. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this should be true of us. We should be known by our love for one another. And I'm afraid I'm afraid it's not what people think of when they see the church. I know, right? They're going to hate us. <laughs> they hated Jesus. They'll hate us too. But he also said they're going to love, they're going to know you by your love for one another. Look for ways. Look for ways this week to sacrifice, to be selfless in service to your brothers and sisters. And that plays out primarily within the context of a local church. This is where this is easy to say, yes, I'm going to love the church. I'm going to love my brothers and sisters. But when you put faces, when you put faces to that, it gets a lot harder, doesn't it? It's not easy to love people. In fact, I would say this. I know I'm, I'm dragging on, but this is so true. Some of you are hesitant to get involved. Some of you are hesitant to begin to serve because you're afraid that you'll get hurt. When you love, you will get hurt. I assure you. You lay down your life. You say, you know what? I'm going to put myself out there. I'm going to open myself up. At some point, you're going to get hurt. People are going to let you down. People are going to stab you in the back. People will turn on you. It will happen. You say, aren't you talking about church people? I am. (laughs) Right? Because we're people. It does not negate the command, does it? Love one 
another. Love one another. Commit to the people of God. Serve the people of God. Love the people of God in selfless and sacrificial ways. Let's, let's look to the Lord in prayer.